本日はご体温のところ本講演会にお集まりいただきまして誠にありがとうございます私司会の秋坂と申しますどうぞよろしくお願いいたします<笑>さて本日は米国アイランド協会エグゼクティブディレクターヤロン・ブルックスをお迎えしておりますヤロン・ブルック氏は1961年イスラエルに生まれ1987年にアメリカに移住しテキ,サテキサス大学で MBA とファイナンス博士号を取得された後7年にわたりファイナンスの教授を務められましたそして財務コンサルティング会社の設立経営に携わった後2001年に米国アインランド協会のエグゼクティブディレクターに就任以来ランド思想のスポークスパーソンとしてご活躍されていますまたこの3月には平等は不公平格差との不毛な戦いイーコーリズンフェアの観光を予定されております本日は日本ではまだあまり知られていないアイルランドの思想と起業家精神についてお話しいただきます So, Dr. Brook, this is the very first Ayn Rand Seminar in Tokyo, and we are very excited to have you here. And、um, Japan, I believe, is an untouched market for Ayn Rand ideas. <laughs> and、uh, so, we'd like to learn basic ideas of Ayn Rand first of all, but Roppongi is the center of innovation and business. So, today, we'd very much like to hear about. American、um, spirits of entrepreneurship as it relates to Ayn Rand and、uh, how you and the rest of the world were inspired by it, etc. So, we will talk to you about Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming tonight. It's,、uh, it's a real pleasure for me to be here in Tokyo. Thank you, Ayumi, for. Inviting me and making all this happen. I very much appreciate it. And hopefully, the introduction was、uh, I have no idea what, what you said. so... All bad. All bad, okay. <laughs> so, when we think about innovation, when we think about Silicon Valley, when we think about entrepreneurship, a number of names come to mind Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Larry Ellison, and many, many others. Right? Mark Zuckerberg, you can probably populate that field with many others from Silicon Valley. And it's not just the Silicon Valley today. I mean, think Hewlett Packard, HP, right? They were there early on. Think about Andy Groves and the founders of Intel. And we could even go further back because Silicon Valley today represents innovation and entrepreneurship and creating new things and new technologies. But this has, this didn't start in Silicon Valley. It didn't start in the last 20 years. This has a long history. In America, going back to people like Carnegie and Mellon and Rockefeller and JP Morgan and Ford and many, many hundreds of others, thousands of other great business leaders, entrepreneurs, innovators, creators, builders. And of course, here in Japan, I don't know their names, so you'll have to excuse me, but you know, the founders of Toyota and Honda and Sony and Mitsubishi and Hitachi and again, dozens of other companies that built the industrial, the innovative base of this amazing city that is right in front of us through these windows. What is common to all these individuals? What is common to all innovators, to all producers, to all creators that have created on this kind of a scale? What is unique to the Steve Jobses and the Bill Gates and the Larry Ellisons, the Hondas? The first thing I think that comes to mind is that these are individuals that have identified certain areas out there in reality. That they can improve on, that they can make something better, that they can change our lives. You know, whether it was Steve Jobs who, who saw computers and said, 
I need to make them easy for people to use. I need to make them so that they actually add to human life. Although whether it was Henry Ford who wanted to make automobiles that all of us could drive. And then they applied thought, reason, logic to solving the particular problem that they faced. All of these individuals, every single one of them, is incredibly rational. They look out at the world. They accumulate facts. They see where the issues are. They see where the opportunities are. They integrate. They come up with brilliant new ideas, and they put those ideas into action. All of these individuals are the epitome of rationality, of reason, applied to the problem of making this world better for all of us. And they have made the world a much better place for all of us. So these are incredibly smart people that work incredibly hard and who are incredibly focused on a particular problem which they solve, but that that doesn't satisfy them, right? It wasn't good enough for Steve Jobs just to solve our problem of developing a great computer. He then changed music, right? And then he changed the phone. He changed our lives by applying his reason, his rational faculty, to these problems. Observing reality, learning from reality, and then changing reality. So these are men of reason. These are men of the mind. I mean, I'm curious, how many of you have read Atlas Shrugged? OK, not that many. Read Atlas Shrugged. <laughs> because Atlas Shrugged is a book about Steve Jobs and Bill Gates. They don't appear in the book, but it's about businessmen like them. It's about innovators, thinkers. might be in different industries, they might do other things, but the principles that drive them, the desire, the reason, the rationality, is the same. So I encourage everybody to read Atlas Shrugged. Once you read Atlas Shrugged, you understand the great industrialists, the great producers, the great innovators of our time and of the past. So the great innovators are men of reason. They use their mind. And they are incredibly independent. These are individuals that don't go by what everybody says you should do. They don't conform to some standard. They break the standards. They shatter the standards. They create their own standards. They rise above conformity, above what the masses want. I mean, it's wrong to think of business as satisfying consumer demand. Because I can tell you, I did not demand one of these. I had no idea. I couldn't imagine this. So how could I demand something I couldn't imagine? Steve Jobs made me want one of these by creating something efficient and beautiful I only demanded it after it was already in existence. Steve Jobs created demand. Great businessmen create demand. They don't satisfy. They create. And that requires incredible independence. Basically he says, I know what you will want. You don't know what you want, but I know what you will want. And I will create the things that you will want. That's a very rare and very courageous thing. Because these people don't just spend a lot of time, they risk everything on these creations. So what categorizes innovators, what categorizes the great businessmen, the great industrialists, is an independent mind. They're thinkers, they're independent thinkers. They think for themselves. They're disruptors. 
Think of Uber right now, right? Disrupting. I don't know if they've arrived in Tokyo yet, but everywhere else they've been, they're disrupting the way markets work. And basically, the founders of Uber said, we know how to do this better than anybody else. You guys don't know how to do transportation. We're going to change everything. And they put a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of thought. And they changed everything. Transportation will never be the same post Uber. So they are thinkers. They are independent thinkers. And they are dedicated. All of these guys and gals, the great entrepreneurs, the innovators, the producers, work hard. They've got a clear purpose. They've got a clear goal. They work many hours. They dedicate their lives to their careers. They are the epitome of productiveness. These are giants of production, of making things, of changing the environment. You know, other animals, other animals either adapt to their environment or they die. They either adapt to their environment or they die. Human beings, we do what? We adapt the environment to our needs. We don't like living in caves, so we build homes. We use our reason, our thinking, and it probably took some independent entrepreneur to build the first mud hut. They probably burnt him at the stake for doing that, or crucified him. But we change our environment to fit our needs. We need, a, we need shelter. So we build shelter. We don't wait to discover the next cave. We build skyscrapers. So all these innovators are shapers of the environment. They change their environment to fit our needs. They teach us what life is, what, what is possible in life by building, by creating, by making. All of them are motivated by this passion. Right? They're motivated by a passion to produce, to make, to create. It's a passion that is about them. They love it. I mean, why does Steve Jobs make this? Why did he do it? Because he cared about me? He doesn't know me? He care about you? Who did he build this for? Real question. Who did he build this for? Himself. Steve Jobs loved making beautiful things. He loved the idea of changing the world. But that was a passion of his. And by the way, he made a lot of money. A lot of money. This thing has profit margins of 50%. Steve Jobs' widow is one of the richest people in the world. So Steve Jobs made this phone for him because he loved it. So fundamentally, Steve Jobs and all these guys pursue their own passions. They're trying to make their own life meaningful. They're all self-interested. They're doing it for themselves. And by the way, not accidentally, we all benefit from it because we all trade and they change our lives. So these are men of reason, of independence, of productiveness, motivated by their own self-interest, by their own passion to change the world, to change their environment to fit their needs and to fit all of our needs. They've changed the world. If you think about Silicon Valley, you think about the last 20 years, 30 years, life is not the same. Because of the kind of innovation we've seen over the last 30 years, we now have, on our phones, access to almost all the knowledge created by all of mankind throughout all of history, right there on your phone. Just ask Siri. 
and she'll tell you anything. I mean, we take it for granted, but this is pretty amazing. It's stunning how amazing it is. And some of us have forgotten what life was like before the iPhone, before the smartphone. It's become such a part of our lives. So the world has been changed just like in the 19th century. The world was changed by the great industrialists, by the great innovators of that period of time. Before Henry Ford and all the other entrepreneurs in the automobile industry, we got around on horseback. Not very efficient. It took a long time to get to New from New York to San Francisco. And of course, we got trains in between, and now we have airplanes. Now again, taken for granted, but somebody had to create them, build them, make them, produce them, build them. And today, we use them, and again, take them all for granted. And they have improved our lives. It's unimaginable. Right? Only 250 years ago, only 250 years ago, life expectancy in the West was 39. I dare say most of us would be dead. That's only 250 years ago in terms of history. That's nothing. That went, goes by like that. And yet, today we live to be 80, 90. In Japan, you guys live particularly long. Right? So those of you young in the audience might live to be 100. And that's no big deal. We have wealth that is literally unimaginable even 50 years ago, never mind 250 years ago. The poorest person in the world today, or in the West today, poorest person in the West today, is far richer than the richest person was, certainly 250 years ago, maybe even 50 years ago. Just think of how rich the iPhone makes you in terms of knowledge, in terms of information, access. So these industrialists have changed the world. These businessmen have changed the world and have made all of our lives profoundly better. And how does our culture treat them? How do we treat them? Now, it's true. There's a certain level of admiration for the Silicon Valley entrepreneurs, a certain amount. We understand to some extent, the contribution they give us. But do we admire them for how they've made their own lives better, our lives better? Do we put them up on a pedestal as heroes? Eh, a little bit for Steve Jobs because there was something about his personality that really appealed. But nobody thinks of Bill Gates as a hero. Yeah, you laugh, because nobody does. He's kind of a villain, right? Nobody thinks of Larry Ellison as a hero. Suddenly, when we think backwards 200 years, we don't think of Carnegie and Mellon and J.P. Morgan and Rockefeller as heroes. Quite the contrary. They're called, in America, we call them robber barons. Robber means thief. We treat them as crooks, as thieves. They change the world. They change the world, and yet we treat them as if they're thieves. We don't respect them. Even today, for somebody like Bill Gates, when he builds Microsoft, he changes life as we know it. Almost everybody on the planet is a little bit better because of what Bill Gates did. And we, we have some respect for him. But when they, uh, in America, when the Justice Department went after him to, to break Microsoft up, a lot of people cheered. They thought that was good. He was never considered a good guy, morally good, hero. When did he become a bit of a good guy? When he started giving his money away, when he started being philanthropic. Right? Now he's a good guy. So making the money, building, changing the world, eh, that's OK. Giving the money away, that's nice. That's good. That's virtuous. That's nuts. That's crazy. 
Right? You can't give it away until you make it. Somehow the giving is good and the making not so good. So as a culture, we don't trust these guys. There's something that we don't like. In spite of the fact that they changed the world, in spite of all the benefits we get, we're not heroes. And why is that? Why is that? Because we as a culture, we don't trust self-interest. We think this idea of self-interest is, uh, what? What's that? Self-interest is selfish, which means what? Synonymous with greed, which means what? Evil, bad. It means, in our minds, somebody self-interested, they're lying and stealing and cheating, and they'll do anything to get their way. And that's so being inculcated into our thinking, into everything we believe, that we associate these great benefactors of mankind, great producers, great creators, with really, really bad things because we know they're self-interested. We know they do it because it's their passion and it's what they really want and, it's what, and they build this stuff in their own image right, based on their ideas. They don't ask us. And we associate that. That is the same term we use, self-interest, with lying, stealing, cheating. We mix the two up. And as a consequence, we don't trust them. If they're self-interested, they must be crooks. You know? So as a culture, we demean their achievements. Yeah, we, we have this mixture. We somewhat admire them, but not too much. Not too much. Lately, as part of, I think, trying to knock these guys down a little bit, because people started admiring Silicon Valley quite a bit. There's a new campaign, at least in the United States. I don't know uh, how much it's caught on in Japan. You'll have to tell me. But the big debate in the United States right now, and in Europe, is about inequality. The gap between those Great entrepreneurs have made lots and lots of money and everybody else. And the gap is big. And it doesn't matter to anybody why the gap is big. That is, that these people produced a lot. It's we need to resent them. We're taught. We need to not like them. We need to attack them because the gap is big. For the sake of the gap. And this is just a new way of knocking these guys down. A new way of portraying them as robber barons. Because what's the assumption when we say inequality is bad, they have a lot and we have a little? What's the assumption that people make? Why is that effective? The assumption is that they have a lot because we have a little. That is, the way they got a lot is by taking from us. Now, nobody actually says that, because if they say it, it becomes obvious how silly that is. Because most of, these, most of these entrepreneurs got rich by selling us things that we want. Otherwise, we wouldn't buy them. But there's an implication. And that implication works to knock them down a notch, to drive them down, to make us not admire and respect them. Ayn Rand's view is very different. Ayn Rand proposes or discovered an ethic that is pro-human achievement, that admires achievers. Why? She looked around. She looked at history. She looked at the world which we live today. And what she saw is that all of human achievements, all of human progress, 
all that enhances human life is a product of what? It's a product of human reason. It's a product of rationality. We don't have, we don't have any other means by which to succeed out there in the world. It takes human ingenuity, human thought, to figure out how to survive. If you look around the room, as an animal, we're weak, we're slow, we have no claws, we have no fangs. You can't run down, I don't know, do you have bison in Japan? You know what a bison is, a buffalo? No? Okay, that won't work. <laughs> you can't run down a bear, right, and fight with the bear. The bear's going to chew you up. He's going to destroy you. A saber-toothed tiger. We're just not very equipped for the physical world out there, right? We can't beat the animals we're supposed to eat. Lions have claws and fangs. They're very good at jumping on animals and eating them. We can't do that. So how do we survive? By making tools. By having hunting expeditions. By having a strategy. By building traps. By using our minds. By using our means of survival. What makes us human is our minds. Agriculture. I don't, anybody have the gene for agriculture? You know how to do agriculture? I mean, that's something that had to be learned. Right? The idea of a seed dropping to the ground and something coming out of, you know, something growing because it rained. Some Einstein of his day had to figure that out. It probably took 100,000 years of people observing that until somebody said, aha, I got it. Right? We laugh because we take it for granted. Because when we were this small, we were taught that that's what happens. But somebody had to discover it. Everything we know as human beings. Somebody, somebody, some individual, not group, some individual had to discover. And again, the person who discovered it was probably burnt at the stake. Because that's what we do with great innovators and have for all of history. But somebody had to think of it. And then somebody had to take that discovery and turn it into a business. We call that agriculture, right? Some Bill Gates of his day said, oh, seeds, ooh, I can take a bunch of them. And I don't even know the terms in agriculture and what you do, right? I make a whole business of producing food. Everything, every discovery, every advancement, every improvement in human life requires some individual at some point in time to make a discovery and apply it. In other words, to use his mind, to think, to use his reason and his rationality to figure out something new. And it required him to be independent, to think differently than everybody else. Because what he was discovering and what he was applying and what he was doing was new. Reason, according to Ayn Rand, is the way in which human beings survive. It is our means of survival. We don't survive by instinct. We don't survive by emotion. We survive by using our minds. So if you care about your own life, if you want to live the best life you can live, if you want to be the best that you can be, then you need to use the tool that we have that makes possible life, that makes possible improving life, that makes possible new things, and that is our mind. We have to use reason and rationality. So for Rand, reason is the most important value. Rationality, rationality, the using our mind, the activity of thinking, is the most important Virtue, the most important activity, the most moral thing one can do is to think. If you want to boil down Ayn Rand's morality into a short idea or ethics, 
what will determine what is right and what is wrong. What is right is to think, think, think. Figure out how to live, what to live for. And be independent. Because the fact is, there is no such thing as groupthink. Throughout early human history, we have been taught that each one of us should live for the group, because the group is what's important, not the individual. But why? Isn't the group just a collection of individuals? And isn't the group's existence dependent on those few individuals who think and discover and innovate and move us forward? Isn't the individual the entity that matters? And doesn't the group indeed depend, the collection of individuals depend on each individual, independent success? And groups don't think. There's no collective consciousness. There's no collective reason. There's no collective senses. The group can't eat for you. The group can't see for you. And the group can't and shouldn't think for you. So independent thought, your independence, you're standing on your own, using your own reason, is an incredibly important virtue for Ayn Rand. And then working. We all need to, 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 to produce in order to live. We need to hunt. We need to gather. We need to do agriculture. Or in the modern world, we need to go to work and get a paycheck so we can buy the food and the stuff that we need. But you need to produce, to create, in order to sustain yourself, in order to survive, in order to live. Certainly, if you want to thrive, you need to be able to work. And indeed, much of our self-esteem, you know what self-esteem is? The sense of self-worth, the sense of belonging in the world, the sense that I'm worthy of this life. Where does that come from? Where do we get self-esteem from? That, that self-confidence, that self-worth. In America, they believe today that if you give everybody a ribbon, that gives them self-esteem. But that's not where self-esteem comes from. Most of us know this. We know that we get that sense when we achieve something, when we set goals and we achieve those goals. And indeed, where is it that we set goals mostly in our lives? Where do we spend most of our waking hours doing what? Working. Working to sustain ourselves. Working to advance ourselves. It's work that gives us the self-esteem. It's work where we challenge ourselves. So being productive, taking one's work seriously, is again a huge virtue for Ayn Rand. Rationality, independence, productiveness. These are the essential virtues in Ayn Rand's ethics. Now who in the modern world and in our history has represented those virtues. Well, we started to talk with them, right? The Steve Jobs, the Bill Gates, the Larry Ellisons. They represent these virtues. The virtues that Ayn Rand has identified as crucial to all human beings for their own success and their own thriving. So as the culture demeans these people, only views them as good guys when they give to charity or when they do philanthropy or when they serve others. Ayn Rand venerates them. For Ayn Rand, these are the true heroes. They are virtuous. They are good. They are moral because they're rational, they're independent, and they're productive. Because they are living their own lives to the fullest. They're making something of themselves. They're pursuing their own life, their own interests, by creating value, by making something, by building something. So if you look at Bill Gates, his philanthropy 
Nobody's against the philanthropy, but that's not what makes him good. What made him good is that he built something, he created something that didn't exist before. That he used his mind to solve real problems. He created a new world, he changed the world. He applied himself, he made the most of the life that he had. So, if we lived in an Ayn Rand world, if you will, these would be the real heroes. We would name streets after the Bill Gates and the Steve Jobses of the world, not after politicians. These are the people that must be respected and admired. They're the heroes. They're the ch world changers. They're the good guys. They're the good guys. So, read Ayn Rand. Read Atlas Shrugged. It's inspiring. It's exciting. It's exciting and inspiring not only because it explains the great businessmen of today and of the past, but because all these virtues, being rational, being independent, being productive, apply to every single one of us in our own lives, to the extent that we are rational, to the extent that we're willing to think independently, to the extent that we are productive, that we're creating and building in whatever scale we are capable of, at whatever level we can, it makes our life better. It makes our ability to flourish and be successful better. It makes it possible for each one of us as individuals to be happy and to prosper and to flourish. Thank you all. ブルクさん、ありがとうございました。アイナンド協会エグゼクティブディレクターヤロンブルクさんにご講演いただきました。それでは引き続き第2部の討論Q&Aに移りますが、ステージの転換を行いますので、少々お待ちください。